Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, three that seven. We've come across a Range Rover with three people in it. Yeah. Yeah, two years, but they're, they're dead. I don't know what that is, blood in the motor over them. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Three men found executed in an apparent gangland attack as they sat in their Range Rover in a remote country lane in Essex are believed to be local drug barons who supplied a network of nightclubs in the area. It emerged last night. The men, who lived within 30 miles of the scene, may have supplied the club where teenager Leah Betts is thought to have purchased the ecstasy tablet that led to her death last month. Police believe they were either lured to the farm lane at Rettenden near Chelmsford to discuss a drugs deal and then ambushed, or they were forced to drive there at gunpoint before being shot in the back of their heads. They were named last night as Craig Rolfe, aged 26, of Greys, Patrick Tate, aged 37, of Basildon, and Anthony Tucker, 38, of Fobbing. They were killed with at least one shotgun and possibly a revolver. Police last night refused to confirm reports that the three victims were involved in a turf feud over drugs. Local sources said, however, quote, they were all known to the police. The suggestion is they were quite high up in the local drug scene. They were more than senior drug pushers. They may well have been the ones that supplied a nightclub where Leah Betts went. Leah of Latchingdon, Essex, collapsed five hours after she took an ecstasy tablet at her 18th birthday party. She is believed to have bought the drug at Raquel's nightclub in Basildon. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, leading the investigation, said, There is no real sign in the vehicle of a struggle or an attempt by any one of the men to get out. That tends to suggest they were either surprised or whoever committed the crime was in the vehicle with them. No weapon had been recovered, although several shotgun cartridges were found at the scene. Forensic examination was continuing last night with the body still in the F-registered metallic blue Range Rover, 250 yards from the A130 Chelmsford to South End Road. Paula Lanas, a home office pathologist, checked the victims at the scene and will carry out full post-mortem examinations today. The lane, part of White House Farm, is used by courting couples and fishermen going to a nearby carp pond. It is known to the local criminal fraternity. A delivery driver was abandoned there after a gang hijacked his lorry load of cigarettes six years ago. An empty stolen safe was once dumped there, and several burned out cars have been left in the lane. Peter Theobald, aged 42, owner of the farm, discovered the bodies with his friend Ken Jiggins, aged 47, a bricklayer of nearby South Woodham Ferrers. They were driving to feed their pheasants kept for shooting parties when they came across the Range Rover parked in front of a locked gate. Mr Jiggins went to ask the driver to move to let them pass. He later said, quote, It looked like they were asleep. It was only when we looked more closely we realised they'd been shot in the head. There were no footprints or tyre tracks in the snow and there was no frost on the vehicle, probably indicating that it had not been there that long. The dead driver's head was to one side. The front passenger lolled forward. The man in the back was lying flat on the seat. The following newspaper article is from the 12th of December 1995 with the headline Hunt for Triple Killer Goes On. Detectives hunting the gangland killer who fired seven shots into three drug barons from Point Blank Range have yet to make any dramatic breakthrough. Inquiries are continuing and officers are following up leads from the public following massive publicity surrounding the triple murder last week. The family and friends of the three drug dealers, Patrick Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, Anthony Tucker, 38, of High Road, Fobbing, and Craig Rolfe, 26, of Kelshot Avenue, Chafford 100, were laying low again yesterday. The shooting of Tate at his home in November last year while he was out of prison on weekend release is being connected to his murder 13 months later. On that occasion, his injuries were not life-threatening and he was taken to Basildon Hospital. Murder Squad detectives are also considering the possibility of a link between the Rettenden murders and October's shooting of a patient at St Andrew's Hospital Billericay by a man dressed as a clown. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley and his team of 30 officers are no nearer to finding a clear motive for the killings, 
though they are sure the deaths are connected to some form of gangland warfare. A total of seven shots were fired through a side window of the metallic blue Range Rover at Workhouse Lane Rettenden with a pump-action shotgun. Police believed the three men who had previous convictions for drug offences and armed robbery would each have been killed by the first shot to the head. Murder squad detectives say the response to pleas for information is disappointing. They are seeking details about the Range Rover the men were executed in on a farm track at Rettenden near Wickford. The vehicle registration is f 424 NPE. The police would also like to interview anyone who had sightings of people acting suspiciously near the scene between late evening last Wednesday and 8am the following morning. The following newspaper article is from the 15th of January 1996 with the headline, My Son Was No Drugs Baron. The mother of murdered Pat Tate has claimed that her son was no drugs baron and died trying to protect his friend targeted for a revenge killing. Pat, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, was one of the trio found shot dead in a Range Rover in Rettendon early on Thursday, December the 7th. They were believed to have been lured to their deaths by a rival gang. But his mother, Marie, 56, said the 6 foot 3 inch 18 stone heavyweight had only attended the risky undercover meeting to support his pal Tony Tucker. She is convinced Tony, 38, of High Road Fobbing and the other victim Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue Chufford 100 were taken out by drugs rivals in a revenge attack for the drug's death of Kevin Whitaker in November 1994. She is emphatic that her son was not involved in that. Chelmsford coroner Dr Malcolm Weir recorded an open verdict into Kevin's death after his drugged body was found in a ditch in Dunton, but his parents always claimed he must have been murdered by being made to take an overdose. Kevin's father Bert said, quote, We believe Rolf and Tucker were involved, but nobody came forward to say how it happened. Tucker was definitely at the inquest and Craig Rolf had a warrant served on him to attend. He said Rolf denied at the inquest that he knew Kevin, but was shown phone bills proving that his number had been rung from Kevin's house. And he added, quote, We heard there was a contract out on Rolf and Tucker, but how and if they did this to Kevin, we don't know. The toxicologist told us he didn't know how it wasn't a murder verdict at the inquest because of the amount of lignocaine one of the drugs involved. Kevin was anti-needles, he hated them. Somebody administered this, but we don't know how or why. Mrs Tate alleged that Kevin was caught up in a deal with a Romford drugs gang involving £60,000 worth of cannabis, for which he would have been paid just £2,000. But she claimed Craig and Tony wanted to stop Kevin talking. She said they injected him with a substance nicknamed Special K, a paralysing drug used on horses. She said, quote, This paralysed his body, but not his brain. They followed it up with what they told him was a line of cocaine which completely finished him off. He was only used to smoking bits of cannabis. Mrs Tate said Pat was in hospital at the time. Craig Rolfe and Tony Tucker told him about it and thought it was funny. But Pat was in hospital after an attempt on his own life by someone else. He was shot while out on parole from an earlier prison sentence, and he forfeited that freedom after a nurse found a gun under his bed and he was jailed again. He had only been out of prison five weeks when he was killed. Mrs Tate said... People keep saying that he was a drugs baron, but he wasn't. He was no angel, but he wasn't one of the people that goes round to nightclubs selling e-tablets. Pat was warned about going to that meeting in Rettendon, but he went to protect Tony. Because he was such a big man, he thought that nothing could happen to him. He and Tony idolised each other. A total of 40 officers are currently working on the case to find the triple murderer. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the inquiry, said... We would be interested to hear from Mrs Tate if she has information she feels would be of use to our inquiries. The following newspaper article is from the 29th of February 1996 with the headline Jealous Drugs Boss Shot His Own Pal Murdered drug baron Tony Tucker has been blamed for shooting his own friend Pat Tate and then supplying him with a gun and drugs while he was recovering in hospital. The fateful alleged shooting came a year before both men were slaughtered. Tucker, who was slain alongside Tate and Craig Rolfe on a deserted farm track in Rettendon last December, either carried out the 1994 shooting himself or arranged it and then planted the gun on one of Tate's other pals, it is claimed. 
A friend of Tate claims Tucker was jealous of Tate's friendship with the other man. The shooting paints a picture of Tucker as a jealous man capable of doing anything to make sure he got his own way. The incident happened in 1994 as Pat Tate was at home preparing to go to Tucker's party in London. He was in his bathroom shaving when the glass was shattered by a bullet which hit him in the arm. Tate's friend, a woman who does not want to be identified for fear of reprisal, says Tucker stoked Tate's fear and paranoia after the shooting by giving him a gun to protect himself while he was in hospital. She also claims that Tucker supplied Tate with drugs while he was in his hospital bed. The gun which fired the bullet was then allegedly planted at the home of a friend of Tate's. The pal was allegedly questioned about the shooting but no one was ever charged. Tate had not long been out of prison when the bathroom shooting occurred. He had been jailed in November 1990 for six years for robbery and drugs charges but was let out in July 1994 on licence. When the pistol and drugs were found, Tate's licence was revoked and he was sent back to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. He was finally released on October the 31st last year, weeks before he and the two other men were shot dead, their bodies discovered in a Range Rover. Police believe the Rettendon shooting was part of a drugs turf war. Tate's mother Marie confirmed that Tucker had supplied her son with drugs and the gun which was found under his hospital bed. She said, quote, Pat could see no wrong in Tony, even when Pat was caught with the drugs and the gun. Tony said he would own up and take the blame to keep Pat out of prison, but he never did. The following newspaper article is from the 20th of the 5th, 1996, with the headline, Rettendon Murders, Two Charged. Two men have appeared before magistrates charged with the triple gangland killings of three Essex drug barons in Rettendon last year. Amid tight security, the men were remanded at a special hearing at Chelmsford Magistrates Court on Saturday. Michael Steele, 53, of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, and Jack Wombs, 35, of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk, were jointly charged with the murders of Craig Rolfe, Patrick Tate and Anthony Tucker in a Range Rover in a farm track at Rettendon on December the 6th. In a dramatic twist, the men were arrested on Monday with Pat Tate's younger brother Russell and three others in connection with a £30,000 drug smuggling ring. Steele and Wombs were charged with the murders on Saturday morning. Steele was also charged with the possession of a six-shot pump-action shotgun, being in possession of the weapon having served a prison sentence of more than three years, and three counts of conspiracy to import cannabis. Steele was remanded to appear at Southend Court on June the 14th. Wombs also faced three charges of conspiracy with others to import cannabis. He has been remanded in custody until May the 24th to appear at Southend Magistrates Court. Darren Nichols, 31, of Baileybridge Road, Braintree, appeared on two charges of conspiracy to import cannabis with Steele, Wombs and others. In a separate hearing at Chelmsford Magistrates on Saturday, Tate's younger brother Russell was charged with two counts of conspiracy to import cannabis. Five others were also charged with drug smuggling. They were Paul Gwinnett, Colin Bridge, Craig Andrealarcos, Sarah Darleston and Peter Corey. Tate was remanded to appear before Southend Magistrates on May the 24th. Detectives said that further arrests were imminent. The following newspaper article is from the 12th of the 8th, 1996, with the headline, Customs Blunder Sets Trio Free. Three men accused of being involved in a drug smuggling ring walked out of court for the first time released on bail. Russell Tate, brother of executed gangland hardman Pat, and three others charged with conspiracy to import cannabis were given conditional bail after customs officers forgot to send vital paperwork on time. Lawyers acting for Mr Tate, 34, Paul Gwinnett, 49, from Frinton, and Craig Angelakos, 22, from Clacton, argued that without the custody order, the court had no right to continue holding the men. It was the first time Dad of Free, Mr Tate, was able to see his wife and children at their Benfleet Road home since his arrest in May. Friday's Southend Magistrates Court hearing was delayed for several hours as both legal teams prepared their cases. 
Magistrate Kevin Gray heard that two more men facing charges of the triple Rettenden murders and conspiring to smuggle cannabis resin could also be released because their lawyers had not yet been given all the prosecution's paperwork because of a broken photocopier. Michael Steele, 53 of Great Bentley and Jack Wombs, 35 of Brockford, Suffolk, are accused of killing Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. Customs and excise lawyer John Butcher told the court that customs officers wanted to question all the accused again, but saw his argument that the custody order was procedural crushed by the defence in a 40-minute legal fight. After the hearing, Mr Butcher remained tight-lipped. He would only say that no further action would be taken to keep the men in custody until their trial. Speaking outside the heavily guarded court four, he said, quote, We can appeal against this decision, but we have decided not to. That is all I can say. All the men have been told to live and sleep at their own homes, not to apply for travel documents, not to talk with each other, not to contact prosecution witnesses, and to attend their local police stations twice a day. Mr Steele and Mr Wombs will remain in custody for the time being. A sixth man, Peter Corey, 44 from Clacton, also facing conspiracy charges, will also remain behind bars because he is accused of other drugs offences. They are all due to appear at Belmarsh Magistrates Court, Woolwich, on October 14th. The following newspaper article is from the 14th of the 12th, 1996, with the headline, Drugs Turned Car Dealer Into a Villain. Friends of murdered villain Patrick Tate, who was found shot with two other men in a Rettendon Lane last Thursday, have blamed drugs for turning a successful car dealer into a gangland thug. Roger Pike, who had known Tate since he was 18 years old, said he started using steroids to help with his bodybuilding and then got into drugs during a stretch in prison. Other friends described the 18-stone drug baron shot three times at point-blank range in a car parked in a remote country track in Rettendon as a good friend who you could trust. Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, used to run a car dealing business in Canvey High Road and before that in Orsett. He was well known to car dealers across South East Essex. He had convictions for armed robbery and drugs offences, and two days before he was killed, he beat up a pizza company manager over an argument about an order. Mr Pike, owner of Pitsy Carriage Company in High Road Pitsy, said, quote, He was a very nice young lad when he was 18 or 19. You'd be happy to take your wife out for a meal with him. The drugs messed him up. He got mixed up in drugs in prison about 10 years ago. He was inside for a moment of madness when he robbed a calf at the Fortune of War roundabout over an argument about the bill. When they finally brought him back from Spain in 1989, he started getting heavily involved in drugs. We noticed a marked change in his character. Tate was extradited from Gibraltar in 1989, a year after fleeing from Billericay Magistrates Court where he was facing armed robbery and drugs charges. Mr Pike continued, I know nobody's got a good word to say about him and I am not trying to make a saint of him, but I am shocked and saddened for Pat because he had a lot of potential. Nobody deserves to die like that. He said his drug dealing was talked about on the grapevine and it was known he was quite well off. Another friend of Tate who did not wish to be named said, quote, Pat was as good as gold. A lot of rubbish has been written about him. If he was worth so much money, why was he still doing car deals for £100 a time just before he died? He had sold cars to Tate in the past, but he could not remember whether he paid in cash, and Tate had taken a car from him to sell the night before he was shot. The following newspaper article is from the 3rd of the 9th, 1997, with the headline, Jury told that drug barons were executed. Three drug barons were executed in cold blood by accomplices in Essex after a dispute over a smuggled shipment of poor quality cannabis from the continent an Old Bailey court heard yesterday. Patrick Tate, 37, Anthony Tucker, 38 and Craig Rolfe, 26, all from Essex, were assassinated as they waited unsuspecting in a Range Rover on a remote farm track in Rettendon, Essex, said Andrew Monday, QC, prosecuting. They'd been lured there on the promise of a substantial future cocaine deal, he alleged. As they sat in the vehicle on the cold snowy night in December 1995, they were shot dead by two men, Michael Steele and Jack Wombs, according to the prosecution. 
With cold and merciless efficiency, Steele and Wombs shot dead the three a number of times through the head, said Mr Monday. They had been victims of a ruse to get them, and particularly Tate, to a quiet farm track where no one would witness what Steele and his right-hand man Wombs would do, he said. Wombs, 36, from Brockford, Suffolk, and Steele, 55, have denied murdering the three men from Basildon. A third man, Peter Corey, 45, also from Clacton, deny conspiring with others to import cannabis into the UK in late 1995. As Steele and Wombs left the scene, they began dismantling the guns used. During the course of those three rapid executions, said Mr Monday, perhaps through the awfulness of what they had done, they chillingly had time to laugh at the fact that one of the guns had fallen apart at some stage. Mr Monday said, what prompted such terrible acts? The answer, it would appear, was a dispute over a consignment of very poor quality cannabis. He told the jury, dealing in drugs is not an honourable trade. It is often the province of the double-cross the sting and double-dealing. They are all stock in trade for those who deal in drugs. Still, Wombs and Corey and others had all been involved in the importation of cannabis, Mr Monday said. They carried out a very, very lucrative trade. They obtained drugs on the continent almost exclusively in Holland, then smuggled them in on a fast open-top boat to the east coast of this country under the cover of darkness. Mr Monday said the dead men were not angels, but notwithstanding their past, they had a right to live. It would appear that Steele was to say there had been a series of disputes between himself and Mr Tate over the quality of drugs. Steele said he learned that Tate was saying he had not been repaid, although he had. He said he heard that Tate was threatening to make him, Steele, beg on his knees and admit he had not been repaid. He would then kill Steele. Whether this is accurate does not matter a jot, Mr Monday told the jury. He alleged that was what Steele had believed, and together with Wombs, they decided they could eliminate that threat once and for all. They planned the executions together. They lured Mr Tate and his two friends to a meeting on the promise of involving them in a substantial cocaine importation. He added, quote, Of course there was never to be such an importation, but Tate bit on the hook. The trial continues today.